Well, he's giving this presentation. So, you know, okay. get under your desk and duck. How, what is it? Duck and, duck and cover? Duck and cover. <laughs> duck and cover. I remember bomb shelters were big back then. Oh, yeah. Drew must have been here already. He was. Yeah. He says he gets here so early because things go wrong so much, but he says that recently he went pretty smooth. Yeah. Does he drive in this early? I think he takes a bus. I think I get up on the He was here before me, and I was here about 10 after 6. Well, just never know the traffic, maybe. So then that street that we park on usually has parking space because there's a two-hour instead of a 10-hour. Yeah. So it's, that's where I've been finding spaces. I mean, I finally, this thing will open the garage for this building, and uh -huh. for a couple of sessions I had Matt, the guy who's at the door, the uh -huh. in. Yeah. He went around and was going to open the door of the garage <laughs> gate, but nobody took him up on it. Oh. So, having, you know, the complaints about parking have seemed to fade away. Yeah. So I just keep coming earlier and earlier. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I, I, you know, I get here, I sit out front sometimes, listen to the book on tape, I don't come right in, but I usually am here by 6.30. I sit out when I get here. Today I got here even earlier, I got here by 6.00. Oh, the 10-hour yeah. parking spaces are the ones that the construction guys take up. Mm -hmm. Two hour ones. Well, for us, the 10 hour ones are a waste of money. Yeah, I have exactly. to put in a, small, a certain amount before it registers. Yeah. Well, I take my chance because it starts at 8 and we're usually out of here by 8. So I never pay, I never put a yeah. sticker on, although I'm going to get burned one of these days. I show you my book. Here's the Coral Sea. I did a Shutterfly book. It's kind of fun to do. You know, you go online. How many people is this isn't it? This boat, about 600 passengers. This was the, these are the guys in our group that went. It's Wendy's sister and her husband. It's Fonts, a high school buddy of mine, his wife. And his, he sits next to these guys at Seahawk Games, so they came with it. But you recognize a lot of this. These are all cell phone pictures. Wow. Yeah. Went out to the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, right there. You can get a picture of this. Nice. You took that picture? No, no, I cheated. I got that off the internet. I cheat a little bit okay. here and there. And this oh, is just beautiful. a view, isn't it? Something else. This is uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Boys out on their own drinking beers. The women were shopping. So, anyhow, it, it just you know luxurious. I treat you like kings. Snorkeling was incredible. I wish I did have an underwater camera. But this is in New Guinea. They're still headhunters, so they pride themselves on all the heads of the people that they ate. You know, so they're just a, a generation from it. And they're still in traditional dress stuff. A lot of this is touristy, but still they're unspoiled. A lot of snorkeling, and they, you know, they just live as primitive. They're hunter gatherers. Still got the pigs. <laughs> what island is it? This is in Kirawana, which is in New Guinea, a little island. Still a lot of volcanic so this activity. Is what you want? This is actually this is our ship here. Okay. This was a uh, Princess Cruise or something. But this is looking down the hill. This you know, World War II stuff was great there. This is Yamamoto's bunker. I shut down Yamamoto on the island close by. But the traditional stuff is, is incredible. Beautiful. Nice big panoramic mm -hmm. pictures of active volcano there that's feeling steam. Uh, this, this stuff that's left over from World War II. Is Japanese or American? There's an American sh a, a plane that was shot down with a nose art on it. It's supposed to be the only one with nose art out of the United States. Yeah. Nice beaches, more shot down military stuff, memorial to the Americans that died on Solomon Islands. Mm -hmm. This is where Yamamoto was shot down. He was the head of the Navy there. The Navy? For the Japanese. He's the See, one who planned it. Midway. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is he the one who planned the attack on Pearl Harbor? I don't think, know that he did that. I'd have to look that up. Do you remember, Jerry, Yamamoto? I don't know whether he planned it or not, but probably uh, I think he was involved. probably involved. Yeah. You know, well, had lots of... All right. Yeah. 
You know, the, uh, some of these pictures I didn't take. This was, you know, they come by with a professional <laughs> photographer. But all the rest, and, you know, they're oh, just still pretty. got to see you. Not too much. Not too much. Well, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it had a hurricane this year or last year. But, you know, this stuff is still around. This is just a crazy you art gallery. Bring it back. No, and I, you know, what I really wanted was these kind of headdresses, but they're not uh, ready for tourist shows. It's just so no. new. Well, they should be selling these kind of things. I would have <laughs> bought them. Sure. And, yeah. But the natives are still noble savages. And they, no, they just dress up for the tourists, and then no, that's where they really do dress. Now, yeah. Obviously, their performance is like playing the horn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the place, you know, where you see it's a kid where they jump off of their feet tied to some Vanuatu. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, a small one, that, uh, over 100 feet. Our guide's brother died on one of these. What did they do? And then his they mom wouldn't let him jump. Yeah, they tie him by the ankles and they jump off from oh. 100, 150 feet. Oh, yeah. oh, so this is a little miniaturized one. Somebody didn't measure the rope. <laughs> this was, I thought, was a sea snake. Actually, it's a type of sea cucumber that looks like a snake. But we were walking around the water. We knew there were sea snakes there. We didn't see any. So Wendy and her sister might have had one drink too many ago. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, the beaches are spectacular. That's the inside of the ship, you know, waterfall inside, just luxurious. Yeah. Oh, and beautiful. the beaches are just yeah. incredible. Good snorkeling. Look at the way this tree just goes straight out instead of the hub. This is a freshwater lagoon we snorkeled in. And, it was, and you know the Blue Lagoon in the movie? Yeah, it was filmed there. Anyhow. Been pretty lazy, pretty bit uh, beach, bleaches, or beaches. Had lots of good uh, spot, uh, talks. This, this is a four-star marine general. This is a rocket scientist. I got some of the stuff from oh, him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that name. This guy, he started BBC. So he was a lecturer. This was part of the... They have, they have lectures, in, yeah. and they have a uh, computer course. This guy's the guy that helped save the California Condor. When they were down to 14, he was up there trapping them. And so it is the entertainment, didn't get nighttime stuff. <laughs> Anyhow, here's a more, I got a few more formal type pictures. More beaches. Oh, How, long was Fiji. How long was your? 21 days. Mm -hmm. Fiji Highlands. Highland uh, we went, to, flew down to Frisco and from Frisco to um, Sydney. You know, they have the kava ceremonies every day. They get a high all the time. People say, I don't want to leave the island. You know why? They're just high on kava all day. So they I guess it's, it. a, yeah, it's a drink. It's a drink? This was in India. They have a lot of Indians in Fiji because the natives didn't want to pick the uh, sugar cane. But these guys, look at all the needles he has through his skin there. It's some ceremony. And anyhow, we're in New Caledonia. Actually, at this point, we're supposed to snorkel. We ended up having to watch the Super Bowl on TV. This is our days. We have a bunch of days to see just sitting around getting too much sun. And we had fun with our waiters and waitresses. Every night was a formal dinner. Coming back to Sydney at dawn. Yeah. Got to go to the zoo. Got the wombats and koala bears and the kangaroos and the cassowaries. And then, have you been to Sydney? Yeah. You know, there you go to the Blue Mountains. Did you go out to the Blue Mountains? That's our that the the Grand zoo. Canyon. Yeah. The zoo is great. And then that was the end of the trip. Nice. Yeah. What's the California? That was a hotel in uh, out in uh, the Boondocks the by the yeah where, where that Grand Canyon is. That's a nice picture at the end. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice trip. It was the first time the ships had been going to those islands. Oh, down yeah, yes. You want to do that now? I could. Yeah. How do we go about doing it? Uh, this opens the gate. So then, then what? Then you're supposed to take a ticket. Okay. And uh, I think you have to stay. Crispy baking egg and cheddar. You, you parked on the street, didn't you? Yeah. Where do you enter for a parking lot? Right on the street.
Not as much as I used to, but for the uh, I haven't done the, that challenge. Next, there's another one that children have, so I've done. I'm going to start doing it again. There's an issue with you going over there and you doing this as well, which is already got present. I think that just got worked out a week or two ago. So I'm going to start doing it again, because I do enjoy it. It's It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I have 10 or 12 parts to your job now. Uh, then we should have a right now. I'm reading things. It's like he's a children's. 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 He's a Two or three months now. Yeah, it's going well. We've really ramped up over the past couple of years. You know, Greg. And have you met Ian? Ian Humphreys. He's great. They get referred to patients from all over, and they're just funneling them into us. So, yeah, it's been fun. Are you guys doing that? My partner does one every few months. I'm just sending them all to you now. It's easier. But Greg is sure a character. He is such an asset. Well, I mean, I liked Weinmuller, but he is so much more available to you than Ernie. Great person. Yes. Yeah, he and Ian. Yeah. You'll have to meet him at some point. He's fantastic as well. They're very similar. Another young EMG guy? Yeah. We had this lady that had a paralyzed vocal cord, and I was in my office some Sunday. I don't really know why. Sunday, so I sent an email to Greg saying, could you see this lady? And 10 minutes later, he sends me an email back, I don't do that. I don't do the realization of vocal cords, but let me reach out to my partner before I leave town. And 10 minutes later, he's got an appointment for the next day. And they filled her vocal cord with Teflon, and this lady was an interpreter, so her job was screwed. She couldn't talk. Is that Marathi, is it? I don't remember who he's been. Yeah, they, just, they inject the dead cord with Teflon and they needleize it, and then you phonate with the other cord. And their their voice is totally normal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they do it here. There's only a special few people that do it, but he was, I mean, the whole thing happens on a Sunday afternoon in like 20 minutes. Where are our other fellows? Both of them are on vacation. Fellows go on vacation? Yeah. Did he ever have a vacation? We were on every night, too. We never went home. Up till both ways in the snow. Back when men were men and women were men, too. That's the way it was. Well, we're unionized now, so. <laughs> get you in? We have a big gate across the entire thing. And this didn't open the gate? No, no, big. Um, I couldn't even get to the gate. We had a big a sealed. How'd you get it open? I pumped the horn and the other guys okay. down there. So this up. didn't adequately? No, no, that opened the gate. Yeah. But there was a big thing before you could even get there. The gate got the car in there? Yeah. I pumped the horn and it opened it up. Did you do that? Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. you know. I, I lost my pass, so I had to get a new one. <laughs> the cheap universe is so cheap to charge 20 bucks for the pass. <laughs> <laughs> We can take away postage and give you a free pass. Um, I can look into it. Yeah, okay. Is anybody having parking problems or is it eased up a little bit? Park further away. I just can't get here earlier. I mean, this opens the gate to park under this building. And you know, I, the first two weeks after I got it, I had 
one of the drug people stand there to open the gate. It's, no one took advantage of it. So I gave up on it. So anyway, if, if there's an outcry that we need to get into the parking sure. space. Um, we're going to do the world. We're the world. A couple of announcements. Um, the last session of the year, which is I think May 23, is the party and evening event that we have. And uh, we're going to have it in the adjacent building, the first of the. We used to have journal clubs a couple of years ago. I'm going to send out, I've been working with the caterer to cater that event, and um, I need to get a rough head count, so I'm going to send out an email later today to everybody to try and find out how many people are going to come. It's usually a lot of fun and games. A couple of people in the room here all asked to donate wine, per usual. And, uh, you couldn't use wine last year because it didn't have a label on it. Yeah, well, this year I don't think it's not the <laughs> <laughs> um, so, RS, send a response so I know how many people are coming, and it's open to everybody from companies and colleagues and uh, family and so forth. If you like. uh, some of you in the room may wonder why we have this talk today, what in the world this has to do with your training and allergy, and the answer is nothing, nothing in the world. Extraterrestrial medicine. Yeah, well, Gary made the talk a little more normal than the one I originally gave him, which was purely about uh, planets outside no. our solar system. No, no, here's what it was. It was, is there life elsewhere, elsewhere and are there UFOs? That was the title. <laughs> it's that, easy. That, that, I think about that every day. <laughs> um, so this has been a long-standing tradition for anybody in the room who's new to this, that I give Gary a topic that has little or nothing to do with allergy or medicine. Uh, he's done great talks in the past about vineyards and winemaking and uh, great literature. Of the the health benefits of wine. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> everyone he's with is having a medical purpose, thinking that we're going to give CME for his presentation. You know no, I always t don't give it. We can try it. That's why we have the world of the day. So, um, I mean, people tell me years later that they remember uh, his, his talks. talks. The only thing they remember out of the whole year. <laughs> um, the good. So, anyway, before he gets started, knowing that he was talking about extraterrestrials, I brought him the, the extraterrestrial hat. You could wear it during the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, he's off and running. That's fine. Thank you. Like I said, I took the literary license to change the title somewhat. Although, it, it, what he gave me actually uh, was fertile soil for an interesting area, so I really got into this. Uh, the title, is, as I said, is Extraterrestrial Medicine, ET Travel, Extraterrestrial Planets or Exoplanets, which is a very hot item and the possibility of finding life. Now you have the obligatory disclosure side, and so I have financial disclosures I do want to disclose with a lot of pride, and I just recently went to the South Pacific and it wasn't cheap, but I received no drug money, so Jerry, we won't tell him. Okay. Anyhow, this is the Whitsunday Islands, this is Hamilton at, uh, by the Great Barrier Reef. And in the interest of full disclosure, I wanted to tell you the beaches were great and the snorkeling and scuba diving was outrageous. So, anyhow, this is uh, the beginning. Anyhow, to keep people from falling asleep, I always have a quiz, uh, a quiz for the rocket scientists. It's a matching the left column, try to find it by the best for answer on the right stuff. So, you might take a quick look at that so you know what you have to look for. Uh, at the end, I pick out people to give me the answer, so you better pay attention. <laughs> Not embarrass yourself, right? All right. You know, I look around the room, and actually, there are a lot of old guys. <laughs> like, they're the only guys that showed up. We just got a few kids here. Uh, so, at any rate, they remember 
the you know the uh, Cold War and the arms race. It actually started at the end of World War II, even before Hitler committed suicide, uh, and we knew his demise was imminent. The American CIA equivalent went in there to try to get all the Russian scientists they could because they were in the vanguard of rocket scientry, which was important for obviously projecting nuclear bombs. We also had the nuclear bomb race, um, but also putting uh, rockets into space. Um, in fact, the German V2 rocket, which was developed in 1942 by Werner von Braun, is, and this is a good trivia question, this was the first object sent into space by humans. It got 100 miles high, and space is about 62 miles. And it came down in 1944, they started using it on um, England. Anyhow, uh, that whole operation to try to ferret out as many of the uh, uh, rocket scientists and the technicians at that time under the uh, name of Operation Paperclip. And the Russians were doing the same thing, so it was a race to see who could get the most scientists. And fortunately, we got Werner von Braun, who developed the V-2 rocket, which evolved into the Saturn rocket, which is still the most powerful rocket ever made, and it sent our, our, our people to the moon. Uh, so we got about 1,500. The Russians got 1,000 in one day under gunpoint. Mm. <laughs> So the, the race, uh, obviously the background is the Cold War, and this is around the time of the Hungarian Revolution, and Zan, I remember we had the Hungarian refugees stay at our house at that time. You had the Berlin blockade, you had uh, Khrushchev who was hammering his shoe at the UN saying, we will crush you or uh, we will bury you, okay? And then the height of the Cold War, of course, was the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. So we felt all that pressure. And it was a scary time that's only been matched by this last week. <laughs> <laughs> in 1957, the Russians started the whole thing and sent up Sputnik, the first satellite in space. And I remember as a kid going out to watch it. Now, one thing about the Sputnik, for us people that went out to watch it, we weren't really seeing Sputnik. The Sputnik was only like two feet across. It was the rocket that went up with it that followed it around, is what you saw. Did you go up and see a bill, do you remember? Did you go up on the front line of this? Okay. You don't mean yeah. the launch, you mean once it was in orbit. Or, orbit, yeah, watching it in orbit. Okay, and, and as a result, Eisenhower created NASA uh, as, uh, to respond. Uh, this was a, uh, a war, an ideologic war. It was kind of the balance because we've had so many nuclear weapons, but still trying to buy for the hearts of the people of. Um, communism versus, uh, uh, you know, the American way. So, anyhow, in 1958, they organized the Mercury program to send a person to the moon, or to, into space, excuse me. But uh, we were actually beat on 421-61. Yuri Gagarin, the person on the lower right, was the first man in space, and he actually orbited the first time. Within a couple of weeks, Alan Shepard was the first American, although he just went into suborbital flight, uh, uh, flight, just went straight up and, and straight down. But as a result of that, and the fact that we had the Bay of Pigs at that time, which was a terrible embarrassment for the country, Kennedy announced plans to go to the moon in the Apollo program right after that. Now, just a quick overview, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, remember when John Glenn went into space, uh, and he did orbit in 1962. John Glenn also has the distinction of being the oldest man ever put into space at 77, I think it was in 1998, on the space shuttle. Uh, after um, uh, we had the Mercury program, then the Gemini space program, named after the Gemini twins, of course, uh, because there were two men in each flight on that, and it was practicing man flights to increase the amount of time in space uh, to be commensurate with at least a five- to six-day trip to go to the moon and back. The Apollo program followed up, and that was the, uh, the moon landing uh, uh, program, and that was from 68 to 72, and we reached the moon, in a way won the uh, space race, and that actually, after we did that, everything slowed down as far as financing for uh, space research. It's been 45 years or more since we went out of low Earth orbit, which is disappointing to me, because I always thought that, hey, someday I'll be able to go to the moon. It doesn't look like it now. We had another program, Apollo Soyuz, and this was absent of uh, going to the moon. It kind of uh, attempted to talk where the Russians and the Americans docked in space, but they did a one flight. Like our, our first uh, Skylab was in 1973, and there were three manned flights there, and then the space shuttle, as everybody is aware of here, 
from 81 to 2011. Uh, then, uh, lastly, what's still going on now is the International Space Station. Now, just to go over the Mercury Space Program, there were seven astronauts. And the purpose was just to put a man into orbit. These were all test pilots, but there was no uh, flying skills necessary because it was just like sending a bullet up in the sky and coming down. They have very little control. The, the book, The Right Stuff, was written about this, which was quite famous by Thomas Wolfe, uh, the same guy who write, wrote the Kool-Aid acid something test. Remember that? All about getting psychedelic and high. But anyhow, these were ha household names. Alan Shepard, Wally Shira, Gus Grissom, John Glenn. The pictures are over there to the right. Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, and Deke Slayton. All of them made it into space at that time. But Deke Slayton, but, uh, he had a medical problem. He had atrial fib and they wouldn't let him go. I should mention that they were such uh, famous people that the day that uh, Gordon Cooper went into space by himself, our dog had puppies, and we named one of them Cooper and one of them Carpenter, <laughs> which is a pretty cute name. Actually. Anyhow, they had six successful man flights. This capsule they were in was uh, hardly bigger than a you know a king size bed. So they had very little uh, ability to room. I'd be remiss if I didn't honor Ham. That's the monkey down in the right. He was the first hominoid or uh, primate to go in space, and he was there several months before the Russians. He ended up being at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and you can see him there. Now, Gemini, again, is aimed after Castro and Pollux, and there was, again, two in a capsule. And this was in preparation for the moon landing. It was getting bigger, about three or four times bigger, so there was room to move around. And there was, uh, compared to the other one, which was one and a half tons, this was up to four tons. Again, trying to increase endurance. The other thing they had to do, because for, uh, to get to the moon, you had to be able to rendezvous and do have docking skills. So this was part of the program. This was the first time, at least for Americans, to have an extravehicular activity. In other words, the spacewalk, and Ed White was the first one to do that. The Russians were still ahead of us at that time. They had done it three months earlier. In just a little over a year, they had 10 manned space flights. So a lot of excitement at that time. Uh, and again, these were all celebrities. Now, the Apollo program was the one that John Kennedy outlined in 61 to try to get us to the moon. And he was successful, he said, before the end of the decade. Uh, there were six successful landings. There was one aborted that everybody remembers uh, that was alive, at least at that time. There was secondary oxygen tank explosion. But 10, 12 people have walked on the moon as a result of the Apollo program. There have been none since. October 11th was the first one. I think probably of all of us remember where we were that day. They walked on the moon and saw it on TV. Armstrong and Aldrin, uh, Aldrin the ones uh, sitting there, were the first ones to walk on the moon. Collins had to go around a lunar orbit to come down. The movie Apollo 13 was about the aborted mission where the oxygen tank blew, and they never did land on the moon. They had barely made it back because they had lost a tremendous amount of power. Uh, it had 13 Academy Award nominations at that time, and the fam most famous line from it was, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, the typical low-key way that astronauts and pilots talk. Two people may not know why the word Houston. Yeah, yeah that's where NASA was at that time, yeah. Huh. It's still there. It's still there. I think there's still some parts of the now yeah. in Cape Canaveral, so... Anyhow, Apollo 17 was the last moon mission that people walked on the moon there, and that was December 1972. And that was the last time we got out of low Earth orbit. I should mention the fastest men have ever been in an aircraft was during this. To escape entirely the Earth's gravity, you have to go 25,000 miles an hour. And that's what these guys were doing when they were going to the moon. Now, um, I, I should reiterate, I, I think I told you before, that Werner von Braun was key in this, because he's the one that helped out the Saturn V rocket. And, and as I mentioned, it, was, it still is the most powerful one, and it used six million pounds of fuel. But Boeing is building it, and, and they're doing testing right now, uh, this week, on uh, building the space launch system, which will be a more powerful rocket. And that will be for the Mars trip, which I'll talk about in a bit. A picture in the lower right is Tom Hanks in the movie Apollo 13. Now, again, so one of the most famous quotes of all time, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind was made by Armstrong. Of course, put the flag on the moon. 
And if you go to the Smithsonian Institute, you can see the capsule on the right. Now, Skylab was America's first space station. That went up in 1973. There were three three-man missions. You can see how big the, as they call it, Skylab Orbital Workshop. This is the biggest single room sent up. There are bigger rooms on, like, space shuttles, but they were modular. This was one huge area, so very impressive. Uh, purpose was mainly to study endurance of manned flights and looking more at the medical aspects, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, they also did lots of experience, uh, experiments studying the solar system. Uh, it was in space a total of 171 days. It was occupied by the astronauts. Uh, the, the group of three that were in the longest was up to 84 days. However, this uh, Skylab may be more fa uh, famous not for going up, but for coming down. <laughs> You know, I, I remember them talking about it. They were worried about it. This is 77 tons of flat, falling from space, and it was, everybody was worried it was going to hit them. And they actually fired rockets to try to make it go off in the Indian Ocean, but it ended up landing a lot of it in Australia around Perth. And if you go to Perth, there's a museum there that, or around Perth, there's a museum that has tons of the uh, wreckage. It did not kill anybody or hit anybody. Why did they send it up knowing it was going to come down? Why didn't they put the orbit out farther? They all come down eventually if they're in low Earth orbit, unless you do something to propel them out. There is enough friction, gradually and slowly, that they're all going to come down. So all the satellites are up there now. They're all no, in other words, to so get it back and to go into space, you got to get up to 25,000 miles. You'd have to have a lot of rocket fuel up there. And that's the biggest limiting factor. You know, the, the rockets you send up are 95% are fuel to get it up. It takes so much energy. How did, how did the astronauts uh, come down or get out of that? Uh, on that, uh, they uh, actually came down in capsules, and I, I don't remember exactly. That wasn't that was before the space shuttle, so you know they didn't land in Perth. But. No, they didn't. They, no, they were they had come out off a long time before that, and it floated around what, for four or five years. Now the Apollo Soyuz uh, program uh, was the We've gone to the moon. The Russians had to admit we beat them there. But this was an attempt at detente where the Apollo, one of the leftover Apollo rockets was uh, still uh, left over that they used to send the space, uh, the astronauts up to meet with the, the Soviet space station. You can see over here on the right meeting together after docking and shaking hands. Obviously, it was uh, symbolic of detente. Remember Deke Slayton, the guy with the atrial fib? They actually let him go on this flight, so he, that Mercury pilot, was able to get up in space. <coughs> this is one thing I didn't realize until going over there. On the way down, somebody forgot to flip a switch, and dinitrogen tetroxide, which is a pellet, propellant leaked into the capsule on re-entry and poisoned the American astronauts, and they are actually in the hospital for two weeks because of uh, chemical pneumonitis. Now we're up to the Space Shell program. This was from 1981 to 2011. The purpose here was to have a reusable spacecraft. And the plan was to make these, and they'd have to do at least 100 flights, ideally, over 10 years. And the weight's getting up there, so you need a lot of propulsion to get them there at 220 pounds, or 220,000 pounds. You could land it, but it was only a glider. So if you miss the runway, you're in big trouble. <laughs> It was, and everybody knows in that picture it was transported on a 747. It's pretty impressive that a 747 could carry that because the uh, space shuttle orbiter itself was about the size of a 737. They made a total of 135 flights. The first was in 81, and the last one, as you guys may remember, is 2011. And they had six different crafts, and they had different names that we're all familiar with. It turns out the Enterprise, there were no manned flights in that, but... The Columbia and Challenger are infamously famous, and then the Discovery, the Atlantis, and the Endeavor. <laughs> Some comments about the actual uh, plane itself. It had, uh, well, the orbit itself weighed 172,000 pounds, and uh, the payload uh, is up to 55,000. Its most famous payload was probably the uh, Hubble spaceship, by the way. I lost my eyes. Okay. <laughs> They had two solid rocket boosters on the outside. They seized. And they both weighed over a million pounds with fuel. 
The external fuel tank, fuel tank, uh, fuel tank excuse me, is the middle one. It is used to fuel the rocket engines that are way back here. So it, it, is, it gives it a continuous fluid of fuel. It's a liquid oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, the for the explosive, interesting for the solid fuel, is atomized aluminum. And it is solid. But you need the boosters to get it up. And they weigh over a million pounds a piece. Here, a piece. And again, this goes all the way up in space. These were recycled. After, it would go about 40 miles, uh, a couple of minutes, and then they would drop off and they had a parachute on them. And I didn't realize this either. And they could recycle those. The, the fuel rocket that went all the way up uh, actually was, is jettisoned once it makes orbit. And so that comes crashing down. But uh, you see how much it weighs here with all the fuel? Almost uh, 5 million pounds. See what it's down to when it gets rid of all the other things, down to 151,000 pounds. In other words, 95% of fuel. the space program of, uh, of the shuttle is fuel to get it up there. It just takes tremendous amounts of energy. Now, the International Space Station, they call it international in the sense that a lot of countries are supposed to participate. It was mostly Russian and the U.S. There are 18 countries. This was actually the ninth space station. The Russians had a bunch before this. The first component was set up in 1998, and it has been continuously occupied by Russians and Americans or whatever since 2000. We're finally getting some decent size where you can move around. It's inside is about the size of a Boeing 747. It was put up in a modular way. Space Shuttle has done multiple visits here to give supplies up there. But the Space Shuttle program's over. So the only way Americans can get into space now, other than some of these private companies, is by paying the Russians, and they charge us $81 million a person. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons, the cost, because mainly the fuel in getting it up there is $15,000 a pound. So, you know, <laughs> that means that if you're filling it up and sending it up with the, uh, uh, with the fuel, it's uh, like three-quarters of a billion dollars to send those things up, you know, if it was a space shuttle, so. Anyhow, this um, obviously led me to look into some of the health issues related to space travel. Let me focus on some of them. Um, when this uh, got uh, converted to this computer, I'm sorry about the title moving all over the place. But anyhow, the greatest risk of trauma, which is one of the major things, of course, <laughs> affects risk, is the during the injury, uh, the getting injuries during the launch, during the re-entry, of course, and the landing. Now, when rockets uh, take off, you've got to get to a speed of uh, 17,500 miles to put it into orbit. So that's a lot of energy to get out there. And if that uh, rocket explodes like it has, obviously it can do a lot of damage to the people that are riding it. Reentry is very dangerous, too, because you have to come in at the right angle. Now, you say, well, why do they come in so fast? If they wanted to slow that down so it could come in gently, they would need as much fuel to slow it down as they took to get it up there. So it's impractical. So it's a good thing that there's atmosphere because the atmosphere is slowing down. Otherwise, they hit the Earth at 17,500 miles, and that would be a disaster. They have ablative tiles, and what that means, they have tiles on the front that actually peel off on purpose to get, help dissipate the heat. Uh, but those are tiles ablative is high tech, and there are risks with it. If you come in too sleep or steep, you get too much friction and the heat up uh, the atmosphere, then you could destroy the heat shields, and if you destroy that, it'll explode. Even on a normal entry, you hit 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If you come in too shallow, you're going to bounce back into space, and you're going to miss the target. And that was a, c a concern with Apollo 13, because if they bounced off, they didn't have enough oxygen left to make it back in. So it was a one and done. Uh, type of proposition for them, but they did make it. The other thing is you've got to start planning your landing. If you're going to land in the Atlantic Ocean, you've got to start 4,000 miles before for your descent because you're moving across the uh, surface. Obviously, you can crash on land and either in the water or on land. If a braking system is inadequate, generally you use parachutes. <coughs> a, a picture on the right is uh, one uh, Russian cosmonaut who was killed in the parachute. <coughs> Now, 
blast injury. Uh, we just had the mother of all bombs, uh, the biggest bomb dropped last week that is non-nuclear. And you get a shock wave if it's going faster than the speed of sound, and of course in a big bomb like that, or a spaceship that's going 17,000 miles an hour that crashes, that kind of stuff. So you get a primary shock wave, and that's how they think in the uh, mother of all bombs called Moab killed a lot of people. In other words, the, the shock wave itself is a pressure wave that goes out, and at a supersonic speed, it can actually tear off limbs, but typically it's worse where the you have differences in body density, so you might blow out your eardrums. That's probably the least worrisome. But it also rips at the lungs and the intestines, so the individual might not have any man outward manifestations of an injury, but then they can have this injury from the blast. Now, you get second injury from all the uh, objects that are energized by the explosion, like in a, uh, uh, all your conventional bombs that have metal and shrapnel in it. Uh, you get secondary from objects energized by the explosion, tertiary injuries by being thrown into objects. Uh, in fact, in the Challenger, that what happened, they got thrown into water. And that's where they died, not up in the explosion. And uh, from secondary fires and falling objects. I'm trying to put a thing into perspective as how risky is it to die from trauma uh, on space shuttles and all these explorations. It's about the same as climbing Mount Everest. About the same percent of people die, which is what? Uh, uh, something like one in 10. Something like that. I, you, I may be a little high. I should have done the math. Anyhow, ironically, the very first tragedy had nothing to do with the reentry and takeoff. It had to do with just experimenting down on land. And the Apollo 1 tragedy that, um, that uh, happened in uh, 1967, Grissom, uh, who was one of the original uh, astronauts, uh, uh, White, who did this uh, first skywalk, and Chaffee died on the ground. And what happened, they were training in a command module for a test, and they had 100% oxygen in there. They thought that would be a good thing. And presumably, an electric spark started a fire. And they could not open the capsule because of the increased pressure inside, and the, and the hatch opened inside. So the guys are struggling to open the oxygen. They couldn't make them burned up inside. They did reach inside the hatch, so it opened outwards, and did things to prevent electrical sparks. But... After that, they were 100% oxygen on takeoff because that increased fire hazard. Now, the Challenger tragedy happened on January 28th. I think it's 1986 that everything moved on this. I think uh, Drew remembers where he was, right? Skiing. Yeah, we're skiing in Colorado. It's one of those same things that you knew exactly where you were. Uh, seven astronauts died. There was a problem with the O-ring of the joints in, uh, in the solid rock rings. And the reason being is the night before, even in Cape Canaveral, it was down to 22 degrees and things were all frozen. And these O-rings, and they'd be right here. These are the solid rocket boosters, so they're big uh, things, uh, the O-rings. It lost their pliability in the cold. Now, they decided to fly because they didn't know that that would cause a problem necessarily, but in the hindsight of the retro, uh, uh, retrospective observation, that clearly was the case. Now, if you look where at this, these are the people in the capsule coming down right here. Now, they're still alive for two minutes. What, what are they in? They're in this uh, contrail someplace. Whoops. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the end of the talk. <laughs> In the middle. There. I'm, I'm pointing. <laughs> <laughs> this one here is supposedly, there's a guy in rocket science on a ship trip. He was talking about it. He said, that, he, said he thought they were in that contrail, so they're heading down to Earth. This happened 72 seconds after takeoff. And again, the O ring gave way, and you can look over here, and you can see where it's starting to give way, so they could see it before it blew. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the fuel is coming out the side, and uh, obviously it exploded. They think the astronauts were uh, killed when it, well, that's the way it looked like, because they got their bodies afterwards. They are crushed. You think they might have had a parachute or something like that, but they, they didn't, so they died there. And of course, uh, one of Ronald Reagan's most famous quotes, we will never forget them. You know, the last time we saw them, this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye, 
and slip the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Now, he did, that was an original ex expression. There was a poem written by a pilot from World War I or Two that wrote that. Now, we, that was followed by the Columbia disaster in February 2003. And in this case, seven astronauts died. On ascent, and I'll show you that in the subsequent slide, uh, there was a large piece of the ablative bone. Now, you're supposed to have ablative bones on these things to, uh, that uh, get rid of the heat. In other words, it peels off the, um, uh, the material to try to keep the heat of the plate from getting too hot. Uh, but too big a piece broke off and hit the, ex uh, the exterior from the exterior fuel tank and hit the wing of the shuttle and broke off composite material in the wing. And on re-entry, where the temperatures get up to 3,000 degrees, like I was talking about, it burned through that damaged area into the shuttle. It was felt to be a fluke that most of the time the ablated material works effectively, but just too big a chunk came off, and they thought it was probably unpreventable. It's interesting, though. They knew about this when it was going up, and, but they decided not to tell the crew because <laughs> they didn't want them to worry about it, you know, and they were still hopeful that it wouldn't break up and burn up. Uh, they thought it was better not to tell them. Anyhow, after that, they have developed an in-flight heat shield repair kit, so now they could repair that, but at that time they did not have it. Uh, here are the people in it, and as you can see in this picture, as you can see where the foam debris broke off and then hit the wing uh, below. Now, a little bit about gravity. Uh, obviously, uh, gravity is what we weigh here on Earth. It, it, you get the effect both from acceleration and deceleration. You get the same kind of gravitational effects. If you're in uh, two Gs, you're twice as heavy as you are at one G. The longer the duration, the more bothersome it is. You can briefly tolerate 100 Gs in a car wreck or football players hitting head to head, but it's only lasting for a second. And, uh, so if you start having more than a few seconds, then even lower Gs can be very uh, uh, difficult to tolerate. Uh, four Gs, for example, that's about like a roller coaster for more than 10 seconds is close to unbearable, unless you train for it like pilots or have anti-gravity suits. The reason is that it compresses your organs. You know, it compresses your lungs so you can't expand it. It compresses your vessels so the blood can't flow. So that's a part of the reason you're so uncomfortable. And if it's heavy enough, you can't breathe. It is best tolerated by laying flat or perpendicular to the G-force, and you could uh, tolerate up to 12 Gs. So if you were in a falling elevator and the cable gave, you want to lay on your back and look up. So the best chance for survival. Great. Anyhow, uh, when the stand, if you're standing, the bullet pulls in the lower extremities. You get a dizzy. It's called a gray out. But you can tolerate up to 6 Gs. Your head's down. You get too much blow to the head. It's called a red out. And it, you may not be able to tolerate as much as three Gs. And just some examples again. And by the way, that's this apparatus down below is uh, NASA's way of uh, testing for Gs by spinning that like a centrifuge. Uh, roller coaster, three to four Gs. Astronaut accelerate on takeoff is three Gs. They could go faster than that, but they don't want to because it's too uncomfortable for the passengers to go higher than three Gs for eight minutes. You know, that's how long it takes to get up there. On re-entry, it gets up to 7 Gs, but at least it's a shorter period of time, a minute or so. And like I said, concussions, most concussions you're hitting 100 Gs. Now, hypoxia and barotrauma are potential risks. Uh, low oxygen, obviously there's no oxygen now in space. They have to supply it. In the uh, shuttles, they are spaceship, they provide oxygen by electrolysis of water. In the future, they should be able to generate from carbon dioxide. The thing about carbon dioxide, when you're breathing out there, it becomes toxic if you don't get rid of it. You get too high a level. But there are uh, chemical ways to get oxygen from carbon dioxide and recycle it, not have to throw the, the uh, carbon dioxide away. Obviously, you can get too low a pressure, especially if you had a rapid decompression or you were going out on a spacewalk or extra vehicular activity. And uh, if you have nitrogen in your blood, just like... Uh, when you're scuba diving uh, and you come up too fast, it can bubble out and your blood will boil. Uh, and so that's called the bends, as everybody's familiar with. And you could get that 
when these guys do the spacewalk to avoid that, they breathe 100% O2, so there's no nitrogen in there, so you won't get the bands. You can get air embolized, just like a, a scuba diver. If he holds his breath and comes up too fast, that air expands and he can blow out the lungs and get air embolized to the brain, etc. And that can damage it. You may end up looking like this fish here. You held your breath. Now, weightlessness. I mean, interesting things, uh, health issues. You get fluid redistribution almost as fast as you get up there because you lose gravity. You get the so-called puffy face chicken leg syndrome. Um, and you, because the gravity is not pulling there, you decrease your uh, plasma volume about 15% uh, because it isn't pulled in gravitation dependent areas. Over a month or so, you get decreased uh, bone density, but you could be two inches taller, so Drew could even be close to six feet. <laughs> you can decrease your muscle mass and be up to 20% in, uh, in 10 days, which is phenomenal. That's a lot of muscle mass. The motion sickness or the neurovestibular effects generally are better in three to five days. So a lot of people have you know motion sickness up there, vomiting and all that. But if you get through that first three or five days, you can make it. So you got you, nowhere to go. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. You got no choice. You, hey, for us as allergists, you get increased nasal congestion, <laughs> and that's just from the fluid coming up. More kidney stones because you have increased bone turnover because you don't have gravity to keep your bone density. What, the problem is you get because of this loss of plasma volume, you have problems when you get back to Earth, and it's called orthostatic intolerance or Earth sickness, and it's due to the decreased plasma volume. So when they get down on the ground and try to stand up, they're all falling and dizzy because they don't have enough blood volume. I presume all they'd have to do is get my IV fluid to probably take care of it. Just a graphic example of this: the fluid redistribution. Here you are on the left, and one uh, G, and you're looking pretty normal. In the initial stage in space, your legs are getting skinny and all the fluid is going up to your head. By the way, you look younger in space. You know, so, Len, you might want to go up there. I got nicks. <laughs> you know why? Because all the blood flow goes up and, and you get a puffy face, it gets rid of all your wrinkles. Been there, younger. younger. <laughs> the, other, the, other, the other thing is you, know, you lose your beer belly because all the organs are floating up. So, you look a lot better. But anyhow, so you're walking around with all this fluid in your upper body, but when you return from space, all of a sudden it starts to go back down. Now they have ocular and some cardiovascular and sleep effects I want to comment on. They get more far-sighted, and it's due to presumably the fluid retention issues because the globe gets flatter, so they complain a lot about blurred vision up there. I call it visual impairment slash intracranial pressure, although I'm not sure that anybody has done a spinal tap prove that up here. They often get flashes in the vision because of cosmic radiation hitting the retina, especially on uh, extra vehicular activity. And there's an impression, although I don't know that this is proven that you get more cataracts when you're up there because of radiation. There are some potential for significant cardiovascular effects, and this may be especially true if you're out like going to Mars and you're out there for a year or two. You get a smaller heart, but it's presumably just decreased uh, vascular volume smaller. But there's also concern your heart's going to atrophy because it doesn't have to pump as hard because there's no gravity. So at any rate, there, there may be that vascular issues. There's concerns about radiation effects on vessels as well. Sleep is tough there. You can see the guy on the right trying to, this is how you sleep. It looks kind of awkward. Um, there's noise. Or you have upset circadian rhythms. Uh, and so you know how you solve that problem? Take sleep and go. Most of them do. Now, I'm not even going to get into this, but anybody that goes into space better be emotionally stable, and they do their best to find them. But you talk about stress, anxiety, depression. I had depression twice in a side. I didn't know that. Isolation, you get claustrophobic. You have an interpersonal conflict because you can't get away from these people, so you need a really stable individual. The Russians have had to bring several people come to bring them down because they're psychoses. Americans haven't had to do that. Now, radiation is a concern as well, and, uh, you know, you have, first of all, electronic uh, or electromagnetic and gamma rays and x-rays are ionizing, but even high-energy ultraviolet rays can give you photochemical damage to DNA. So the biggest concern is long-term is increased risk of cancer. Cosmic rays are really not rays. They're actually high-energy particles, the protons and neutrons and the nuclei of atoms. And, again, I talked about the retinal stimulation 
those. Now the sun gives off a solar wind of these same particles. It's a lower level energy, but it still has potential for uh, carcinogenesis. Now the concern is when they're out there in space, you never know for sure when the solar flare is going to come, and you're going to have a really high amount of cosmic radiation coming at you. And you really don't want to be that on a spacewalk because you could actually get acute uh, uh, toxicity from uh, radiation. And Are they and unpredictable? Right? Are they unpredictable? I think, well, you've got eight minutes, I think, to find out. You know, oh. so. <laughs> That's that wrong. Yeah. So, uh, yes. that's how long it takes to... Well, light. Yeah. And this can be a little slow <clears throat> because of particles, but they're, they're probably going pretty damn fast, probably close to speed of light. Even more power is the galactic cosmic radiation from supernovas. We have higher particles and even higher energy. And that would be a great risk. Uh, if you know that they're coming should make a point, there are some like pebble-sized particles that are going around the universe. And of course, you're traveling around 20,000 miles. That's 10,000 times faster than a bullet. And if you've got a little tiny pebble hit you at that speed, it could uh, uh, do damage. And that's why they've got these spaceships are built to, with, uh, to handle that. Obviously, they could even get hit by major uh, space debris. And, and there are concerns about, obviously, excess of heat and cold. And I won't go into that because I'm running out of time. Just a comment on the right, and it's hard to see this. You know, alpha particles, I didn't realize this. I can't get this to work. Kind of pointer. There it is. Alpha particles, you know, the helium nuclei, are stopped by paper, so they don't go very far. They are used in prostate cancer treatment, which you've got to put them right directly. Beta rays are, uh, are um, uh, beta ray is an electron, excuse me. Our electrons have traveled, uh, uh, have stronger energy, but they're even stopped by aluminum, a thin sheet of aluminum. They're used, of course, in uh, thyroid cancer. Now, the higher energy gamma rays and the X-rays, you need a lead apron. That's why when you go to the dentist, they put it on you. But here, this is interesting. The very highest one, the galactic cosmic radiation, aren't stopped by that. And if there was in space the knowledge that this was coming, best place for the, uh, uh, for the astronauts to hide is around water. Mm. So they get in the middle of the tank where the water is and try to hide behind that if you have that happen. Now space, uh, just some uh, brief mention, uh, of course, the Toy Story character. Uh, his outfit is pretty much close to the one you can see that they really do wear in the lower right there. They're incredible at regulating temperature. They have water-filled coils that can heat or cool down from 250 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 250. You need oxygen, of course, and like I said, when you're breathing out, you've got to get rid of that carbon dioxide. You don't want to keep breathing it, and it binds to lithium hydroxide, and then they throw it outside the ship. However, in the future, they will be able to recycle carbon dioxide from, uh, and use the oxygen from it. Now, you maintain the pressure, of course, in airplanes at 6,000 feet. If you didn't have air pressure, you can't have oxygen exchange. So they do use 100% oxygen, you know, before they go out to prevent the bends. The suits protect from uh, radiation to a certain degree, and the micrometeorite issue, they have woven stainless steel in the uh, space suit. They carry a communication system. They've got to get something to collect body weights. And the suit itself weighs 56 pounds, and all the support equipment, 189 pounds. But of course, it doesn't make any difference because it's weightless. Now, some nuisance problems you don't think about with weightlessness. You can't uh, put out a, a knife and fork and eat with that. You can't set out a table. You have to eat out of tubes uh, for both uh, well, solids and liquids. So it isn't very tasty, the food. There's no running water. You have the issues about uh, urinating and defecating, and there's a picture on the right. You got to strap down. If you had to pass Big Flata, she might go flying across the room. <laughs> so, they, uh, the other thing is they don't have an awareness of bladder fullness that you have with gravity telling you your bladder is getting full. So the solution to that is they just routinely go to the bathroom every three to four hours. Now, they have difficulty bathing because you can't just put the water on. Although I watched a YouTube that you, the water kind of sticks, I guess, by surface tension. So you can kind of pour it on there and you can move it around there. 
but the easiest way is to use a damp cloth, use rinseless shampoo, and dry with a towel. It's interesting, they don't clean clothes, they wear the same ones over and over again. And to be honest with you, it gets pretty stinky up there. A sweat doesn't evaporate much, and, and odors don't dissipate very well in a confined space. Now, what is space? Space is, a, uh, is estimated 62 miles high. That's where you can no longer get lift of an airplane because there's not enough atmosphere. So uh, all, most low Earth orbits are uh, about 100 to 1,000 miles high. Like I said, it takes about eight minutes to get up there. You can stay in orbit at that elevation if you have enough speed, and the speed is around 17,500 miles, which is 25 times the speed of sound. People say, well, there's no gravity there. There is, too. There's 90% gravity still. You're not that far away. You say, well, why are you weightless? It's because you're constantly falling toward the Earth as you orbit. That gives you the weightlessness, even though there's 90% of the gravity there. Uh, to get it completely away from the Earth's gravity, like going to the Moon or, or Mars, you've got to go at least 25,000 miles. It takes that much more fuel. It gets that much more expensive. At low Earth orbit, takes about 90 miles, and all of it's gone out, and you can see 10 satellites in an hour looking out. They get uh, to experience sunrise every 45 minutes at that speed. Also, you have increased radiation exposure, but it's not terrible unless you're out there a long time. Now, there are different types of orbit, and I've already mentioned the low Earth orbit, and again, you have to travel about 17,500 miles. Medium Earth orbit is between 1,200 and 22,000 miles, and this is where a lot of the GPS satellites are, at about 12,000 miles, because they circle the Earth twice a day. They're farther out and visualize more of the Earth. Um, so it can, uh, you can get your equipment on Earth to see it more readily. Now, you can have actually a geostationary orbit, one that stays over a fixed point on the Earth, only if you're on the equator. So you can have that circling around at the exact speed the Earth is going around and visualize that. <laughs> Geosynchronous is also just 24 hours. It's exactly the same difference, but not over a fixed point. In other words, tipped uh, uh, along the edge of the quarter, uh, equator going above the or, uh, below. If you get into high Earth orbit, which is over 26,199 miles for the geosynchronous, it takes greater than 24 hours to go around the Earth, so it's moved, the, the, the satellite's moving retrograde. To see the poles best, you have to have an large ellipse pole um, uh, orbit. And that's what the Russians mostly use because their continent is so far north. They're not so good with the equator type orbits. So. Now, there are Lagrangian points out there, and those are five points in space. That's supposed to be the sun in the middle and the earth on the right. That uh, you have a stationary area because of the balance of gravity in those five areas. The closest one to the Earth is about, and, and the Sun is about a million miles away, either L1 or L2. We have put the uh, satellites in these areas just for that purpose, because they stay stationary. And we have the Gaia Spice, uh, Space Observatory to map the galaxy is at L2. There's a term called Trojan asteroids, and those are asteroids that occupy these Lagrangian points. And like Jupiter has thousands of tens of thousands of them. Earth has one, and it's at L4. So that's another place you could put satellites. Now let me talk about travel to Mars. You know, we haven't done much in the last 45 years, at least as far as I'm concerned, because we haven't gotten a low, had a low Earth orbit. And now we're planning to go to Mars, and it keeps getting moved back, and we're hoping that about uh, 3,000, or 3,000, in, in, uh, in about 10, 12 years we'll be there. Uh, anybody see the movie The Martian? Actually, it was good, and it gives a good portrayal of what it's like and the things you have to worry about. You can see the landscape is terrible. Uh, this is number five from the movie Short Circuit down at the bottom. It looks like all, very close to a real Land Rover, and there are about five of them now scoping it out. Now, what are the problems with Mars? There's little atmosphere. There's no greenhouse effect. 95% of the air is carbon dioxide, which is poisonous to us. And the air pressure is one less than a hundredth of the Earth's. And you have lots of radiation exposure. There's no oxygen or carbon cycle like plants. And it's a red plant because it has iron oxide. And I was thinking, well, they can get the iron, uh, 
oxygen from the iron oxide, but you can't, well, you can do it, but you have to use a blast furnace to get it separated, so it's not very attractive. On the other hand, there is a water under the polar ice caps that could be used as a source of oxygen, and then, in theory, the carbon dioxide of the, or dry ice, uh, which is very cold, could be converted to oxygen, too. So there's some potentials for using their oxygen. And, uh, oxygen. <coughs> it did have a hot iron and core and a magnetic field when it first uh, originated, but no longer. It has an incredibly giant dust storm, so it is not the greatest place in the world to go find a place as an alternative to the Earth. They use the term terraforming to try to find a place uh, away from the Earth that you might be able to live and survive. But this is certainly not attractive for human colonization. However, I think Mars is the only legitimate place that we have, at least the next several hundred years, to go to and, and, and possibly set up uh, housekeeping. Now, the travel to Mars, which is projected to fly in 23, but uh, it will go to an asteroid before, and it will go to the moon before. So we're going to get somebody on the moon, presumably, in the next 10 years. My sister, and it's my birthday, so. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, the cost is about $500 billion, which obviously taxpayers don't like paying. And it's going to take multiple trips. It's not like you can just take off from the Earth and take everything with you in one fell swoop. They're going to have to get a lot of it out there into space, and then you're going to use it from there and then project it there. And there are probably multiple loads they'll have to take to Mars to leave. Mars leave off stuff uh, that they can use there. They can only go every 26 months or so to minimize the distance and the amount of fuel that you're going to use. On the right is the Orion spacecraft. It looks very much like the Apollo spacecraft, but it's a little bit bigger. The, as I mentioned, the Space Launch System rocket is being tested at this time, made by Boeing, and it'll finally be more powerful than the Saturn rocket. Obviously, you've got all the health risks on Mars that we talked about. You'll need a lot of fuel, and back there, when we land, we do need something to slow it down, otherwise we'll have a crash landing there. So you got, need a lot of extra fuel to slow down there. You need a food source, and my understanding, they're going to take all the food with them on the trip, but they're going to try a greenhouse there. Okay, and then you need lots of water, and that's going to be a problem, although they try to cycle 90%. Even now, they recycle all your urine and sweat. Why is it that they want to have a capsule as opposed to like a space shuttle that they could fly to Mars instead of the capsule? You know, the plan is to just use one rocket to get them all the way there. You know, they might use a shuttle for getting stuff out into space, but it's a one, or, one and done, I think, kind of attitude on this. It's just too complicated. Now... This will get back to Len saying SETI on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You know, you don't know what's out there. Will it be ET or friend or like alien or possibly even something more frightening? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what they get out of there. So. Anyhow, the primary effort there is by monitoring incoming radio waves with radio telescope. Uh, telescope is a passive technique. Uh, there are many techniques, but most of it is, is uh, monitoring electromagnetic radiation in the radio or, or microwave range. We have up to 250 million simultaneous channels from space. We haven't picked up anything yet. You say, uh, well, first of all, radio wavelengths are less likely to uh, be present and not too store, uh, distorted or dissipated over distances as opposed to light and light. You look for narrow signals repeatedly sent at one specific frequency on the radial dial just because nature is more diffuse. And this would suggest you have a deliberate effort by a sender. The question is what language is it going to come in and who nobody has any idea. Presumably it would be mathematical signals. Now the government won't fund this anymore. It's too quixotic. So it's supported by private funding. And when you need private funding, who do you go to? Paul Allen, it is the Allen Telescope Array, which is in Hat, Hat Creek, California. That's a picture of it down on the lower right. Now, there's also active uh, transmission. So we sent out the Arecibo message from space in 1974, which was the most powerful broadcast ever beamed into space. This uh, image on the bottom uh, is what they uh, transmitted. Again, I don't know how the aliens are going to be able to figure it out, but uh, way on the right, this is our binary numbering system here, encoded, and they have 
at the very bottom of what the uh, Arecibo uh, uh, message was sent from by the big broadcasting radio telescopes. Anyhow, uh, it's an effort. I don't think it's going to pan out myself. Now, the hot thing now is exoplanets. I'm finding new planets around other stars and other solar systems. And there are two primary ways of finding these exoplanets. One is by what is called the radial velocity technique. That's the upper one. There we go. Okay. And what it does is it can tell if an object is circular, circulating around a sun. Because the sun is affected by the gravity of that object. And so it wobbles. If there was nothing there, it wouldn't wobble. So they can tell the wobble by Doppler effect of it moving away and moving towards you, okay, about how much it moves. And by that, you can deduce that there's a planet there, and you can calculate how big the planet may be. The only problem with this technique, what it picks up is huge planets that are very close to the sun and would not be habitable planets, so they need to get something better. They, they call them you know, hot, uh, uh, hot Neptunes and hot, hot Uranuses. Huge gases planets, which would be very fragile. But they did show that there are planets out there. This term, uh, the term used for this is HARPS, or the High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. Now, another method is to the stellar planetary transit photometry. And what this entails is if you've got the planet perfectly lined in front of the star in your line of sight, it'll diminish the amount of light coming through and they can deduce that there's something circulating by the decreased amount of light. And they have what is called a Kepler telescope. It's in space monitoring 145,000 stars in the Milky Way. And they can see whether there's a, dim a diminution in the light transmission. From that, you can infer the mass, the distance, and the size. And you can also, because the light comes through uh, the planet's atmospheres, get what are called biosignatures. And this is another big thing in the future. What I mean by that is the light comes through, and you can see on the lower right, and it goes around the planet, and you get the spectrum, uh, and you can look by spectrophotometry and see what kind of gas is in there. And if they have oxygen, and they have ammonia, and uh, things associated with light, that may be one of those that you want to hone on and, uh, and study even more. Now, we got some problems with this, so, you know, we're picking up mainly just big planets, and we need to get smaller planets about the size of the Earth and far enough away from the sun so it doesn't uh, burn it up. And they need new telescopic technologies, and they're called terrestrial planet finders. There have been a whole bunch of uh, suggestions to do this, and they've designed telescopes and all that, but it hasn't got the funding, but I think it will in the future. You need higher resolution telescopes, ideally out in space, and you need to eliminate all the starlight somehow. And you can do this by uh, using destructive interference of electromagnetic emissions. Anyhow, it's, we haven't really used this yet, but it plans to be used in the future. And the same principle as this uh, graphic on the bottom shows: if you can have a star behind the planet and watch the light come through, you can see what kind of biomarkers they have. Or so, or they call that biosignatures. Now, I'm getting there. Uh, finish up quickly. Is there a life in outer space? Here? And in 1961, uh, Drake, along with nine other scientists, including Carl Sagan, came up with an equation to try to predict uh, civilization. And if you say N is the number of civilizations that, uh, that could communicate. R is the, the, the rate at which stars are born. A lot of these are very reasonable numbers. Fraction of stars in planetary system, that's good. Number of planet-like stars are reasonably easy to estimate. The fraction of planets where developed lights, I think primitive life like microbes, it will happen a lot of places. Here's the one I have a big difference. They think uh, one in a hundred or one in ten uh, will develop intelligent life, and that I disagree with uh, uh, totally after, you know, you know, look at how many CD receptors are 400, how many microRNAs are 300. How are you going to evolve this many? You know, how to try introduction across cells. I still don't understand that. You know, how, how do you get that? Anyhow, I think they overestimated. Anyhow, in the fraction of intelli uh, intelligent beings who develop technology and the lifetime of the civilization, 
civilization with the ability to communicate. That's what most of these guys think is the limiting factor, because we're probably going to blow ourselves up or kill ourselves and we won't be around very often for very long. So I'm going to skip, you know, this has to do with habitable planets because I'm getting close to the end. And I, I'm the, I don't think that we'll be able to communicate, and these are the reasons. I think there will be life, but it will be mostly single cell or primitive life forms. The universe is a hostile environment. There's just too many variables have to align to develop intelligent life. It took four billion years to get intelligent life on the Earth from single cells capable of communication. Um, planetary stability has to be for billions of years. It relies on the longevity of the civilization. The biggest reason is the immensity of space, as far as I'm concerned, the limitation of communication. The closest star is four years away, and it would take eight years just by light to communicate. More likely, it would be thousands of, or uh, light years away. To have contact with even the closest star would take us 40,000 years to get there at our very fastest capability this time. A guy, two professors here from the University of Washington, do you know Warden Brownlee? Anyhow, they wrote a book called Rare Earth, and I agree with them. There's just too much uh, uh, that has to happen from an astrophysical, geologic, and evolutionary circumstance to get intelligent life. I don't think that, I think there may be some out there, but I think it's going to be rare. And just a last comment, you know, basically, I think for the next uh, several thousand years, we're going to be stuck with the Earth as our home, and we have to treat it well. I think there's a good chance, uh, based on uh, a lot of big and crazy egos right now, that we may not have to worry about that or have to communicate with. <laughs> so now the quiz. I got it right on. Okay. All right, you guys ready? Sure. Okay. Let's look at my cheat sheet. The right stuff is about what? Mercury. All right. The Gemini space program was. I got to look too. Uh, where's the Earth walk? That's a little embarrassing. Over sphere. Yeah, extra vehicular activity. Okay, number three, the Challenger tragedy, the oh, whole ring, yeah. Earth sickness syndrome, is orthostatic yeah. intolerance. Yeah. Chemical pneumonitis was after the Apollo Soyuz flight. And they, you know, they let the gas leak in. First rocket in space was the B-2 rocket in 1942. Trojan asteroids are Lagrangian points. The last manned mission was the last Apollo 17. Operation Paperclip was getting a burner from the front. Uh, Mars was... Space system. Yeah. Yes, right? And exoplanets are the Kepler telescopes. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, yeah, that was great. That was great. Great as usual. Great. Amazing. Uh, that's beautifully done. Thank you. Oh. So, Gary, what's, you're up in, let's say, Mars. Would it be easier for rapid space travel from there? Because there's no atmosphere. Yeah. Could you, you know, make that just a space launch? It, it'll be easier to uh, slow down there for, uh, as far as the speed. Although, it, uh, uh, it, it's still going to be a heck of a tour de force because they have to send so much stuff up early. And so, and, and it certainly is not a very enticing environment. So I, it, I think it's kind of like the moon. It will be neat to get there and say we got there, but I don't think it's going to be much of a long uh, experience. Did you come across any of the space elevator talks about... You know, that makes sense. And, and you know what? There's no reason you couldn't walk into space, but this takes so much energy. I don't think I'm going to be... You could yeah. walk up on a space elevator. You don't need 17,500 yeah. miles an hour. Nope. You do if you're starting from Earth, and you've got nothing to pull yourself off. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it has to be uh, 100 yeah, miles long to like, uh, yeah. get there. Yeah. 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 The actual way that it is begins to fail itself. And so that's why they like the carbon <laughs> tube strong because of its slight weight. Pencil strength versus their weight is that you can actually make that ribbon at that length. Yeah, so I don't doubt that that's, that's the future. I don't doubt that it's whether they can overcome it. The yeah, I don't think it's one of the engineers. Yeah, it's true. I see a funny story about the previous conference. Um, when the first, any takers? 